some family secrets? I don't want to hear them. But today we do discuss why you should include your family in the estate planning decisions. Then finding money you didn't know you had and how to get top dollar for your home. All this and more on today's episode of The Wealthy Life. Welcome to The Wealthy Life. Are you keeping your estate wishes a secret? What's to hide? Estate planning advisor Jacqueline Knobloch is here to explain why keeping your family in the discussion is important. Jacqueline, welcome to The Wealthy Life. Hello. So why do people think that this is such a secret? I don't know if it's so much a secret, but they're just uncomfortable. Naturally, talking about estate planning relates to the fact of end of life and that's not usually a fun conversation but I think the biggest driver is a lot of people in their 60s, 70s, 80s they've never included their children in the conversation about money so to all of a sudden open up the books and say hi this is the end result of decades of financial decisions is naturally uncomfortable and so they just avoid it altogether. Yeah there's a few taboo topics and money is one of them and I think even with that generation more so than maybe other generations yeah. But if you don't talk about it, bad things might happen. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so what are some of the benefits of having a family discussion about estate wishes? I think for most clients, their intent, their reason to go into estate planning is because they have a certain amount of wealth they want to transfer to their children because they want to do something nice for them. So to include their children in the conversation really means it's personal and not only is the intent um, positive, but it's also received in a positive manner. So each child is generally very different and their lifestyles are different. So it allows for a really conscious giving and how those children inherit the family wealth and how legacy continues onward. Oh, that sounds so nice. <laughs> and I know when talking to people, sometimes having that conversation encourages them to maybe give some things away earlier while they're still alive. Because, or even at least having the conversation, you get the benefit of giving while you're still here to enjoy it. Because after you're gone, who knows? Exactly. Now, do you ever see any examples where people want to give certain items away to certain <laughs> people and the receiver does not want it? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. A lot of the clients that I work with have businesses. And so maybe right now all the children work in the business and everything is great. And they just naturally assume that all the children are going to continue to work in the business. But when you have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, what you really find out is often there's one child actively involved in the business. That's their business. They want to see it for decades to come. And quite often with others, one may actually want to make a career change when mom and dad are no longer apart. And another factor to consider is those individuals and their marriages. So if you're giving shares of a business to a child who may have concerns about marital future, that might not be the best long-term strategy for the survival of the business. Wow, everything that you just said, there's a lot to think about. You guys better be paying attention. And when you think about the scenario, maybe Johnny doesn't want to take over the business anymore. If you didn't have the conversation, you would never have known that. Exactly. And given the values of a lot of these businesses, they make up a considerable amount of a family's net worth. So if we want to have equal distribution of wealth to all the children, we want to make sure there's enough capital in the conversation to make it equal per child. Oh, and that's a really good point. So if the business is 80% of the value of the estate, it's going to one of four children. Well, that's only going to leave 30% or 20% left for the other three kids, and that's not fair. Exactly. So what are some of the options that parents could do in that scenario to even it out? So we look at all the different assets and what they might be as value in, in later in life to see if that discrepancy still holds true. But there's a lot of different products out there to help equalize the state. And one of them quite often is use of life insurance to make sure that we generate the capital needed upon end of life so that there's an equal distribution among the family. Yeah, and I guess the other option is the one beneficiary could buy out the others, but that's assuming they have the capital to do so. Exactly, and that's not always in the best interest of the individual or the company to start laying out that much capital all at once. So is there some ways that people can start the conversation without getting too personal? I mean, does a do we need to tell our kids and our grandkids everything <laughs> about what our assets are worth and how much we have in our investments in our bank account? Or should we just talk generalities? I think it depends on the family. So I'll say quite often families just need to have an understanding of 
what are the assets? Is there a home, a family property? Is there a business? What are the major things that are in play? And as they have those conversations with the children, they'll get a general sense of how engaged they are in the process and considerations that may need to be made. So for one of the children, there may be a reason to go into further detail if they see them play in a more active role in their life long term, because as people get older, they do often need help, and that generally comes from one of the children. So there may be a reason for that. But right off the get-go, there's not often a reason to all of a sudden spread all the information and say have at her just because their requirements in terms of making decision isn't the technical know-how it's more of a conversation between parent and child. And I think one of the most common decisions so I'm going to go back to the example of four kids some parents think oh I'm just going to appoint all four the executive. <laughs> Not a good idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> what goes wrong in that situation? First off, there's a reason for most families, assuming a certain amount of net wealth, that you generally want maybe a third party to be the executor. It's not an enjoyable job. Nobody wants to be the executor of an estate. And quite often, many people don't realize it can take at least a year, often up to three, to actually complete an estate and have probate completed and have um, assets sent out to the family. So you're really putting an onerous job on one, if not four, of your family members. And to try and have them all agree on decisions when they've just lost a parent and there's a high stress and high emotion situation, that's not an environment for positive outcomes. Forget it. It's a nightmare. Hire a corporate uh, executor. Good advice. And for those of you wanting to know where to start, we have a family discussion checklist to make your life a little easier. Contact us at The Wealthy Life. Jacqueline, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. And when we return, learn how you can take control of your finances today. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Since COVID, we've adjusted to a new normal and will have financial implications for years to come. Joining us from Nova Scotia is cash flow expert Stephanie Holmes Winton to share practical strategies to help you manage your money. Stephanie, great to have you on The Wealthy Life. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we have enough technology for me to be there and be here at the same time. I know it's perfect. So, as a cash flow specialist, what does that mean? What's your background? So I started as an independent financial advisor and I learned very early in my career that a lot of people made good money. Most of them didn't know where it was going. And there were some pretty big gaps in the industry around cash flow management and debt management in particular. So I set off to try and find courses or tools to use with my clients. I found very little, so I decided why not work on that? So Just I have spent almost, tw <laughs> if it yeah, almost exist, 20 years. It. Yeah, almost 20 years trying to um, create something that others could use. And most importantly, that could help people get more life from their money. Well, that's great. And you mentioned something earlier about not knowing where your money's going. That seems to be a common trend. What are some of the common money mistakes you see? So I think I see uh, a lot of things that most people do. And the, the thing I always like to make sure people understand is if you feel like you're making good money and you don't know where it's going, please don't assume you're dumb or you do something wrong or you're bad. It's just very complex. So I would say like one of the things you got to be careful of is just figuring out where it went doesn't help you figure out where it should go. So be careful thinking that, you know, an app that will tell you how much you spent on coffee or uh, setting on a notification that will yell at you when you spend too much on coffee um, will fix habits. It, you need a little bit more than that. That's and so, so true, Stephanie. And, you know, I thank you for saying that, because I think when it comes to money, a lot of people feel shame or they're embarrassed and they don't want to talk about it and they just avoid it. They put their head back in the sand. Well, that's not going to fix things either. So no. don't be ashamed. If you're having trouble with your money or you're spending mm -hmm. more than you realize, you can get better. You can ask for help. 
Yeah. And um, you don't have to necessarily be evidently overspending. So it doesn't mean that you are um, necessarily doing really bad things uh, in order for you to be having less available cash than you actually could have. So you could also feel like you're doing a really great job managing your money, but there could still be some financial leaks happening. So just having a look at your cash flow every now and then is a really important part of any kind of financial plan or any kind of goal setting that you might do. And I see a lot of people um, feeling that, you know, they, they really feel like they have the best rate, but they might have a bunch of different types of debt. And that's one way that money can leak out. So yes, maybe you have a really great rate on your mortgage, but maybe you're carrying four other things. They're at various rates. And we have a tendency to only think about that 3% mortgage and not really think about the 9% interest on our line of credit. So thinking about how your debt is structured is a really great way to find some money. What are some other ways people can find money? And let's talk a bit about intentional spending. So, mm -hmm. you know, people don't realize what they're spending their money on. And you mentioned looking at the cash flow. What are some other things that are common, I guess, leakage of money? So I'd say there's two really big offenders. There's, um, we would separate expenses into two different types. We would say a committed expense is a low emotional risk expense. It's something that you probably consider a bill and it's pretty easy for you to figure out how much you typically spend on that type of expense. And so things like your debt might be in that committed expense category where there's money leaking out because your debt is inefficient. Um, maybe your cell phone plan isn't efficient. And those committed expense leaks tend to be something that are a one-time effort. So you go refinance your mortgage, one-time effort. You call your cell phone company and change the bill, one-time effort. So that's one kind of leak. And then we classify the other types of expenses in your life as spendable. So those are things that are high frequency, high volatility, high variability, and they're usually a little bit of, of enjoyability. So really these- Latte? Yeah, and groceries. So sometimes people are think, well, I need groceries. Correct, you must feed your children. And in order to live, you must feed yourself. But you but don't groceries, need filet mignon every single day. Right, <laughs> right. And we think gasoline prices are volatile. Red peppers are more volatile in most cases than gasoline. And so we have to be really conscious of the type of expense. So everything that's spendable is high risk expenses. So what happens is when people do a one-time effort on a committed expense, that is manageable. We don't have to be conscious of it over and over again. But when we try and cut back those uh, spendable expenses, that's kind of overwhelming to the brain. So what we find more effective is to set a spendable number and physically separate those expenses so you're not doing mental math because humans are mostly not very good at mental math. Oh, wow, Stephanie, you've given us some really good takeaway tips for the average viewer out there to put extra money in their pocket to spend how they want it. And for those of you at home that would like some help with your cash flow analysis, we have a cash flow worksheet to make it easy. Contact us at thewealthylife.com. And Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing these great tips with us today. No problem, thanks for having me. And don't go away, because after the break, learn how to get top dollar when selling your home. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Did you know your home is likely worth more today than you thought? Realtor Dean Innes will show you the key points to ensure you maximize your house when selling. Dean, welcome to The Wealthy Life. Thanks, Sybil. Happy to be here. So Dean, how many years have you been in the real estate industry? I was licensed in 2004, so 16 going on 17, I guess. Okay, yeah. so I'd say you know a thing or two about getting top dollar for a home. <laughs> I've been around a while, so yes. So where do people start? If they're thinking about selling, whether it's their primary residence or just a property they own, what is the first thing they should do? 
Yeah, so you probably want to talk to somebody like myself or uh, a number of us, because like anything, when you uh, interview a service, uh, you probably want to get some quotes and talk to three different character or personalities. Um, so yeah, that would be the start, and, and do basically you're interviewing them uh, right. to see what uh, they have to say. And when it comes to assessing the value of someone's home, are ta tax assessments pretty accurate? Um, there are times where they are accurate, but uh, tax assessments are always based on the uh, assessed value the year prior in July. Okay. So if you were selling a, pro a property in the spring of the next year, you, you kind of need to look at the compar comparable market value of what the sales are doing then. And then uh, because th those tax assessed values at that point are probably about nine months old. Okay, so then I would interview a few different realtors to come in and say, hey, what is my house worth? And someone who knows the market, such as yourself, is it better to price it a little bit higher, a little bit lower, or right on the money? Yeah, so that's a huge thing is pricing correctly, and that's why you're hiring a professional to hopefully help you find that sweet spot. Um, they're going to provide you with a market evaluation based on comparable sales over a 90 to 120-day uh, period, and you're going to be able to pin down pretty quickly based on your square footage and bedrooms and location compared to other sales uh, what your property is valued at. And of course, everyone thinks their house is probably worth more than it really is, but sometimes it's actually worth more than they thought. Right. What are some things the homeowner should be doing before the house gets listed on the market to really make it show well? Exactly, great question. Um, so uh, first impressions are key, and so prep is, uh, is a, a big item. Um, you're not probably gonna uh, renovate your kitchen or bathroom, but you can do some affordable things like uh, paint, uh, fresh paint's affordable, uh, doing some yard care, maybe hiring a landscape company to come in and clean up your yard, and property staging, which doesn't mean we're gonna take everything out of your house and put new stuff in, but you have a professional stager come in and they'll work with you to uh, look at what you've got, reposition it, declutter, minimize, and then bring in some of their own pieces. Declutter, okay, have you ever had clients you've worked with that have been kind of hoarder-like? <laughs> and what do you do with that? Yeah, so that's, a, that's where you need the stager, yes. <laughs> because it's tough to tell somebody they're hoarder-like, but. <laughs> <laughs> you need to sort of dance around that a bit. So that's usually where we would uh, say bring in um, a stager and say, hey, you know, let's work together and see if we can get this place looking a little more sort of market ready. Let's temporarily move some of this clutter exactly. around, make yeah. it look clean. Exactly. Now, you mentioned the kitchen and the bathroom. You don't need to do a big renovation. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it might be necessary. Do you get a return on that type of investment? You do, but at the point where somebody's deciding to sell, um, wanting to renovate a kitchen or bathroom, they're probably wanting to save that money for their next uh, home. Because right. if they're considering selling, they're going somewhere and they want to save those funds for investment. So, I mean, if they had to, uh, if they're looking at selling maybe a year or two out, yeah, sure, maybe they're going to renovate the bathroom. But if it's something where they're thinking, hey, I'm going to list my property in the next you know, 90 days, probably not going to happen. So just do the things that are affordable and really basically minimize minimize and make it look a showroom, like when you walk into the urban barn showroom. Yes. You yeah. want it to look like that. Right. <laughs> and sometimes people's idea of a renovation, what they thought looked really good, maybe would not be very good for buyers. So again, working with a professional, a stager, yeah. might point out the things to spend money on and not spend money on. Exactly, yeah. And as long as, as if you spend a little bit to get a lot back, then it's worth it. But sometimes people go over the top. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, so you just want to, you, you want to spend what you need to, to get it to where you're going to get that maximum. And, and in this day and age, it's all about the online presence and the marketing of the, of the property that you're going to work with your agent and they're going to tell you, he or she, what they're going to do to expose your property as broadly as possible. Should people spend the money on getting an inspection done before they list? Yeah, pre-inspections are a great idea. It takes away some of the surprises that might happen at an inspection. So, um, you know, an inspection might run you $500, but it might point out something that you're going to be able to uh, deal with in advance and that's not going to become an issue uh, during the negotiation process, yeah. Which everyone wants, because yeah. if you know you've got a couple of deficiencies, if you can just fix those up, then the buyer coming in with their inspector it'll all be taken care yeah, of. Yeah, and it shows a, a good uh, good faith disclosure. Like if you have an inspection done in advance uh, and you can provide it like in part of your marketing and say, hey, look, we, we took it upon ourselves to do this and there were a couple items that we've addressed and here they are. And uh, yeah, it just goes a long way to giving that buyer some confidence. Well, Dean, this has been great. I know that uh, Sotheby's has a fantastic seller guidebook. This is awesome. All the viewers should download this. We'll have a copy and a link on our website. Um, but it goes through things in quite detail of what people can do so that you get top dollar when selling your house. Thanks for being part of The Wealthy Life today. Thanks for having me, Sybil. Appreciate it. And stay tuned, because after the break, find out how to pick the best credit card.
Welcome back. Thanks for your emails, tweets, and messages. Today's question is from April. Dear Sybil, there are so many credit cards to choose from. Which one is best? Well, April, it's a great question, and I would say it really depends on usage and the type of benefits that may appeal to you. If you're the type that doesn't carry a balance on your credit card, you pay it off in full every month, then you wanna look at one of those credit cards that's gonna give you perks and benefits. If you're a traveler, I recommend finding one of the credit cards that gives you travel reward points, because those generally equate to about 2% of the value you spend, so 2% of your charges is the actual benefit back to you. If you're not a traveler, then maybe consider a cashback credit card. Those benefits are nice, because who doesn't like cash on their credit card statement? But that's only usually equivalent to about 1% value. If you are a traveler though, you wanna also watch out for foreign transaction fees. Many credit card companies do charge two to 3% foreign transaction fees when using your credit card in a different country. So ultimately you'd wanna find a card that didn't have that. Now, if you are the type that does carry a running balance on your credit card, then the best card for you is gonna be one with a very low interest rate. So you're not paying a lot of interest charges. So my personal preference, because I like to travel, is a credit card with travel benefits and a companion pass every year. And that wraps up this edition of The Wealthy Life, helping you make smart financial decisions. Join The Wealthy Life Club by becoming a member at thewealthylife.com. You'll get access to everything you need to help you live your version of The Wealthy Life.